it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to speak here at the Peterson Institute, which is a group that uh, uh, it's driven much of the most important discussion of international economic issues over my entire working life. Uh, I've uh, uh, always been uh, engaged with it. I only wish uh, that we could all be there in person. So uh, perhaps soon. Uh, a little over uh, 420 years ago, a crowd pleasing uh, local poet on a lightly populated island in the North Atlantic made popular a phrase that has entered our language. Uh, beware the Ides of March. Caesar ignored the soothsayer and the results weren't good. Uh, if recent history is any indication, maybe we should keep the warning in mind as well. In March of 2008, we witnessed a significant domino fall in a chain of events that sparked the global financial crisis with the collapse and sale of Bear Stearns. March of the following year saw the nadir of the Dow Jones average, a 50% drop from just over a year earlier. And the margin calls and liquidity crunch in March of 2020 were a salient echo of the other significance of the Ides of March for the Romans, the deadline for settling debts, which have had an unsettling habit of coming due in March in our recent financial history. In fact, this time last year, both domestically and internationally, the financial regulatory community fortified itself as COVID-19 and related containment measures spread across the globe, which I refer to as the COVID event. The Financial Stability Board moved into high gear, holding weekly, usually daily meetings with the most senior leaders of central banks, finance ministries, market regulators, to share information and to shape a synchronized global approach to the financial stability challenges at hand. This ability to spring into action on short notice is exactly why the FSB was established in the wake of the great financial crisis. Its mandate to promote international financial stability by coordinating the development of regulatory, supervisory, and other financial sector, sector policies and actions at a global level reflected a recognition of the growing interconnectedness across our markets and economies. My focus today will be on the future and the challenges we face going forward, in particular, non-bank financial intermediation, or NBFI, and cross-border payments. These are only a portion of the FSB's comprehensive work plan, but they're priority areas that will have significant impact on the financial landscape going forward. So since the crisis of 2008, the non-bank sector has grown and evolved considerably. It accounts now, as you all know, for almost half of all global financial assets uh, and did so at the start of the COVID event. With this growth has come greater interconnectedness and complexity in intermediation chains. Even before the market turmoil of last March, the need to understand the vulnerabilities arising from the non-banking sector, as well as those uh, uh, from the banking sector, as well as those risks that had moved outside the banking system was viewed as critical to achieving and maintaining financial stability. The March market turmoil helped focus our attention on non-bank finance and pushed the FSB to give further priority to work in this area. Because of the way this diverse sector is structured, developing uh, an NBFI perspective requires bringing together regulatory, supervisory, and market perspectives and taking a broad view of how our financial ecosystem works. So even ahead of the COVID event, in my role as chair of the FSB, I formed a high level group of central bankers and market regulators to oversee and coordinate work on NBFI which by March was clearly a fortunate decision. Under the direction of this senior group, the FSB carried out its holistic review of the March market turmoil, which examined not only how different sectors of the market were affected, but also how those effects were transmitted throughout the system and which aspects of the financial system structure may have amplified stress. The holistic review underscored how vulnerabilities in the financial system amplified the economic shocks of the COVID event, in particular, it highlighted the dependence of the system on readily available liquidity and vulnerabilities if liquidity strains emerge in money market funds and open-ended funds, through margin calls, and in core bond markets. Importantly, the uh, holistic review provides a high-level view on how these parts of the financial ecosystem operate and transmit risk while under stress. In my view, one of the most significant findings relates to money market funds. The holistic review documented how the extremely high demand for liquidity 
combined with a flight to safety, triggered a dash for cash that hit institutional prime money market funds particularly hard. In the United States, prime money market funds publicly offered to institutional investors had outflows of roughly $100 billion, 30% of the fund's assets over two weeks in mid-March. This was a faster run in terms of the percentage of fund assets redeemed than during the turmoil in September of 2008. Similar patterns were also seen in Europe, particularly for US dollar denominated funds. Other funds that are active in short-term funding markets, such as ultra short bond funds, also saw unprecedented outflows in March. The March market turmoil is the second time in roughly a decade that we've witnessed destabilizing runs on money market funds. More concerning this time, however, is that we've taken steps between these events precisely to reduce the likelihood of such runs. The FSB will publish a report in July for consultation that will set out consequential policy proposals to improve money market fund resilience. The proposal should also reduce the likelihood that government interventions and taxpayer support will be needed to halt future money market fund runs. This work will also consider the relationship between MMFs and short-term funding markets with a particular focus on commercial paper and certificate of deposit markets and the impact of dealer behavior. Continued work on other open-end funds, margining, and bond market structure and liquidity will come on the heels of the MMF deliverables. As a first step, the focus will be on enhancing our understanding of vulnerabilities that could emanate from these sectors, including risk transmission channels. Addressing systemic risk in a dynamic sector that continues to evolve is no small feat. So I expect policy-related discussions and recommendations to follow the analytical work and that will likely extend beyond this year. Uh, although we don't really have enough time this morning for me to provide uh, deep detail, uh, I'd like to note that the disruptions in bond markets also raised questions about the role of leveraged investors uh, and the willingness and capacity of dealers to intermediate in times of stress. So work is underway to gather data and analyze dealer behavior to develop a comprehensive view on their impact on financial market functioning and to determine whether policy responses are necessary. Turning to a different part of our MBFI work plan, the March market turmoil demonstrated the benefits that central clearing brings for global financial stability. In fact, central counterparties demonstrated resilience during this tumultuous period, but given their systemic importance, we continue to move work forward to improve CCP resilience and resolvability uh, as set out in our annual, in our uh, 2020 resolution report. So I'm coordinating with the chairs of the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, of the BIS, of the International Organization of Securities uh, Commissions, and, and the FSB Resolution Steering Group on shaping these details. We expect to launch a work stream this year that's aimed at further strengthening the resilience and resolvability of CCPs in default and non-default loss scenarios, including assessing whether any new types of resources would be necessary to enhance CCP resolvability. The FSB and other standard setting bodies have also begun work on margin activity in centrally cleared and non-centrally cleared markets during the peak of the market volatility last year. We observed that margin calls by some CCPs may have been larger than expected. Uh, and obviously while we need to ensure that CCPs are sufficiently margined, they're critical nodes in the financial system, clearing members and their clients also need sufficient transparency and predictability to be able to manage their exposures. To be successful, this broad and comprehensive agenda, which serves as a cornerstone of the FSB work program for 2021 and beyond, will require strong coordination, commitment, and resources from the international regulatory community, including at the FSB and other standard setting bodies. Further, to, to ensure a sound, practical, and effective way forward, these work streams will also require transparency and engagement among the public. The FSB is therefore seeking the input of market participants and other uh, parties. So this MBFI work alone would be an ambitious agenda, but I think the FSB is well equipped to address this challenge while also furthering the other important elements of our broader agenda. So let me spend some time talking about another of these important objectives, which is enhancing cross-border payments. In 2019, the G20 identified enhancing cross-border payments as a key priority, and the FSB has been dedicated to advancing this important work ever since. The challenges associated with cross-border payments are widely known and long-standing. 
and prior attempts to make improvements have struggled to gain traction. In October of 2020, the FSB delivered a multi-year roadmap to the G20 leaders who endorsed the way forward and committed to advancing meaningful change aimed at increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of cross-border payments. Ultimately, we're focused on addressing the core challenges of cost, speed, accessibility, and transparency. It goes without saying that making improvements is easier said than done. Frictions underlying existing processes span multiple legal, operational, processing, technological, structural issues, uh, and those can differ greatly by region. Uh, so to break down the magnitude of our task, the roadmap includes a set of practical actions designed to address specific topics, which we refer to as building blocks. We're taking a comprehensive approach and engaging the public and private sectors because both need to be part of the solution if we're going to achieve the ambitious goals we've set for ourselves. So to begin, we have to decide what the actual improvements are that we want to see and how we'll monitor progress in achieving them. Uh, these decisions will define the level of ambition, create accountability, and shape how the roadmap is put into operation at the global, regional, and national levels. As a first step, the FSB has formed a task force that's responsible for setting specific quantitative targets, and these targets will set the tone and pace for the work that follows, and are therefore among the most important of the deliverables that we'll complete this year. We, pl we plan to publish a consultative paper in May, and deliver a final set of targets to the G20 in October. Several groups are charged with advancing one or more of the building blocks in the FSB roadmap over the course of this year, with the FSB providing annual updates to the G20. Uh, we're collaborating closely with the Committee on Payments and Markets Infrastructures of the Bank for International Settlements, which has a key role given the position of central banks in the payments ecosystem. In addition to setting targets, the FSB is leading multiple elements of the roadmap itself, advancing those building blocks that are more exploratory in nature, for example, the soundness of global stablecoin arrangements. And on this particular topic last year, the FSB issued high-level recommendations for the regulation, supervision, and oversight of global stablecoins, and will report to the G20 this year on the progress achieved at both international and national levels. By their nature, cross-border payments are global, they involve many other countries outside of the G20 membership. We therefore have to be conclusive, inclusive in our approach while remaining well organized to meet the milestones we've set for ourselves. And to that end, we've partnered with the World Bank and with the IMF, given their respective missions and their global reach. It will also be important to engage with financial institutions and service providers and industry groups, practitioners and academics as we advance this work. So we plan to communicate information and seek feedback through public consultations, conferences, and bilateral and multilateral outreach. The roadmap sets our path, but the practical reality is we need consensus among and action by many different and even competing stakeholders to achieve success. So we purposely build into the roadmap opportunities to course correct because we expect to learn more as we go. The FSB will report annually to the G20 summit and to the public sharing progress and seeking confirmation on the next steps for this immensely important and ongoing work. So what I've just discussed covers a large portion of the FSB's 2021 work plan, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a few other significant areas. We are of course continuing to closely monitor vulnerabilities stemming from the COVID event, including the rise in non-financial sector debt and measures of bond and equity market valuations. In April, the FSB will report on key considerations involved in amending or unwinding COVID support measures as appropriate. And the FSB will play an important role once unwinding measures begins, given its work to support international information sharing and COVID-19 policy responses. We also plan to assess initial lessons learned from the COVID event for financial stability and to share those with the G20 in July. The COVID event has underscored the financial sector's susceptibility to operational risks, especially those related to cybersecurity. The speed of technological change and a growing reliance on third-party technology-based services is increasingly introducing new risks and vulnerabilities to the sector. So to begin to address this, the FSB is focused on achieving greater convergence in areas such as regulatory reporting of cyber incidents, and will deliver those recommendations to the G20 in October. Next month, 
the FSB will release the final report of its most ambitious evaluation of the effects of the post uh, great financial crisis banking reforms. The report on too big to fail reforms is our most analytically rigorous evaluation carried out to date. When looking at these reforms, indicators of systemic risk and moral hazard moved in the right direction and effective too big to fail reforms seem to have brought net benefits. In fact, at the beginning of the COVID event, we observed a far more resilient banking sector than that which entered the 2008 crisis. But if the benefits of the too big to fail reforms are to be fully realized, there remains further work to do, and we outline this work in the forthcoming evaluation. Further analysis of such reforms, international financial standards, agreed G20 and FSB commitments, recommendations, and other initiatives will provide us with better insights into whether the package of reforms are working as intended or conflict with each another, are structured efficiently, and if they're in need of refinement. One last particular item to mention, LIBOR. Transitioning away from LIBOR is a significant undertaking that the FSB has been engaged in for almost a decade. The FSB set forth a roadmap for clear actions that financial firms and their clients can take to ensure a smooth transition away from LIBOR. And this year, the FSB will report to the G20 on ongoing progress and issues related to the LIBOR transition, including supervisory issues related to the benchmark transition. We faced a confluence of events over the past year that demanded international coordination in several key areas, and that's precisely why the FSB was created more than 10 years ago, a beacon at the end of another fateful march. The span of territory and topics covered can seem bewildering at times. I'm sure it did in the overview I've just given, and I covered only a few of them today. Uh, but as the FSB builds its agenda for each coming year, uh, the process is like a pointillist painting. Each topic viewed by itself is a series of complex data points. But on stepping back, we see the connection and interdependence of the various elements. The role of the FSB is to orchestrate a unified image and a coherent approach to ensure that we continually monitor and address those hazards, the shape and form of which we've already identified, while allowing for vicissitudes like the COVID event, which arise quickly with little notice and that require extra space on the canvas. There's little margin for error in doing this. Achieving our objectives requires the utmost in diplomacy as well as rigorous analysis. Uh, and in light of all the challenges we've faced over this extraordinary year, I'm proud of what my colleagues in the FSB have done. Uh, my fellow public servants from around the globe working on FSB topics have been steadfast in their daily pursuit of a unified mission to promote international financial stability. And I think the work we've laid out for 2021 does just that. Thanks. And I'll, I'll be glad to take any questions, uh, Adam, whether on FSB issues or Federal Reserve issues or anything else you have on your mind. Thanks. Again. Thank you so much, Randy. As you said, uh, U.S. Chair of FSB with your colleagues from around the world, are dealing with an incredible range of, you would use the term bewildering, um, topics and technical issues. I even, as a former central banker, this, this gets a little tough going for me. So I'm going to get, I'm going to ask you to sort of go back through some things and explain more. Um, in particular, let's start with, you've mentioned the FSB has a report coming on non-bank financial inter intermediation part of which used to be referred to disparagingly as shadow banking. Um, what can you tell us about ideas of activities-based versus firm-based or institutional-based regulation, especially since, as you said, there is this constellation of different entities in the same space effectively. They're, they're taking up more and more of our financing, but they're very differing in nature. How do, you, how do you see that issue? So, you know, I, I think that's a great question. There have, you know, over the years been, uh, you know, in uh, among folks who think about uh, financial stability policy, you know, uh, academics, policymakers, many, uh, there's been skepticism uh, expressed about the sort of objectives and uh, and worth of the activities-based approach. But I think if you look at the uh, fault lines that were thrown into particular relief in March of 2020 uh, in the non-banking sector, I, I think it emphasizes that it wasn't that there was any particular uh, globally systemic behemoth 
uh, the failure of which we were concerned about uh, potentially triggering further instability that we could have uh, perhaps prevented had that behemoth been designated as an entity in advance. Rather, you know, there was a, a network of activities uh, being conducted by many players, uh, none of which were probably systemic in and of themselves, but the activity of which clearly was systemic. And I think that it, uh, I, I think that it emphasizes that particularly in non-bank finance, uh, an activities-based approach is going to be necessary. You know, perhaps in some cases supplemented uh, with entity designation. But really, principally, it's, uh, it's focusing on the activities and the interconnectedness of uh, many individually non-systemic players uh, that's going to be needed uh, to have a picture of and a response to potential instability in the non-bank sector. Thank you. And, and sort of the flip side of that is, and I was going to ask this even before your remarks, it, it looks like the traditional banking sector has weathered this particular march and last March reasonably well. Um, to what so without asking you to compromise security on the forthcoming analytical report, I mean, what what do you think was different this time? How much do you think it is regulatory and supervisory changes since 2008 that made a difference? In particular, in your preview, you mentioned the idea that there does seem to have been some beneficial effects on against too big to fail and moral hazard. For those of us who understand those concepts but are not supervisors, how can you tell? Uh, well, I, I mean, uh, in, in some ways, the proof is in the, the pudding. We had, uh, I mean, the banking sector was uh, a, a source of strength uh, in this crisis. We took uh, some measures at the outset because of both the high level of uncertainty and because this was the first, this was the first real test of the post uh, great financial crisis system, uh, if you will. So we, uh, we took some additional measures on top of, the, uh, of those that the system itself would have required. I'm referring uh, specifically to the limitations we put on uh, uh, the return of capital from the banks uh, uh, during the crisis itself. Um, but it's clear, you know, that was a wise thing to do given that this was the first test uh, and given that it was kind of a world historical event uh, that we were facing. Um, but you had a system that was uh, strongly enough capitalized uh, that even when it took really quite dramatic reserves in the second quarter, uh, uh, which was, you know, the size of those reserves, in fact, was uh, driven by some accounting uh, modifications in the wake of the great financial crisis, both IFRS 9 uh, abroad and CECL in the United States. So they took very large reserves that under the current accounting methodology were their best estimates of the entire loss that they could be expected to take. And they still remain very highly capitalized, uh, although those, those reserves, you know, hit their capital. So, um, and indeed, their capital grew over the course of the year, notwithstanding the very large reserves that they took. So I think the key reforms were the much higher capital uh, and liquidity uh, that required of institutions. I think that the wisdom of that uh, was borne out uh, in the strength of the banks during the crisis. You know, I would say as well, you know, there's been some Oh, hand wringing sounds excessively dismissive. So let's uh, let's put it in the correct light, which is to say there have been appropriate uh, questions asked about the modifications, uh, the uh, sort of refinements and recalibrations that we've been doing in the United States over the last uh, uh, three and a half years to that post-crisis framework. We uh, said that we intended to do that in order to improve the efficiency without uh, undermining the resilience uh, of the system. And I think, again, the performance of the system in this very strong test has demonstrated that we did that. So in, the, in that sense, I mean, there, as part of the capacities that Congress and the Fed built in, there is a countercyclical capital buffer. I mean, was this a de facto use of it? Um, are there periods in which legally you can, not legally, but I mean, legally de jure using it because it hasn't been used so far officially. I mean, when would the counter capital buffer come into play? So, so 
So that's an interesting question on which my, you know, the, the COVID event itself has caused my views to evolve somewhat. So uh, in the United States, at least, um, you know, we had, our capital levels were very high. So, you know, the way I uh, uh, took to framing that issue was that effectively we had turned our counter-cyclical capital buffer on already because our, our capital levels were uh, really the highest in the world. Uh, and our problem was going to be uh, turning it down um, uh, in a time of stress uh, because we had done that through calibrating our through the cycle measures as opposed to adding a counter-cyclical capital buffer on top of it because every time we looked at uh, every time we looked at the situation, it was, well, we have, we, we have enough capital. We shouldn't be increasing capital further at this point. I think that's exactly how it played out. We had to take some emergency measures uh, in order to ensure, uh, in order to help ensure proper mar market functioning, such as the uh, changes we made to the supplemental leverage ratio, uh, which, will help, which were uh, helpful there. Um, and that served the function of, uh, it was a quasi turning down of a counter cyclical capital buffer, uh, if you will. Uh, had we been in a position where our through the cycle uh, capital levels had been lower and we had turned on that buffer and then been able to turn it down, uh, as, as was the case in many other jurisdictions. But the reason I say that my thinking has evolved uh, is that when you look at some of those other jurisdictions uh, that were in a position to have turned on their countercyclical capital buffer going into this stress and then turned it down, uh, it didn't actually prove to be that useful in creating the space for those institutions to uh, continue to lend uh, through the uh, through the crisis. Uh, there were. Uh, I would say it is a topic on the international agenda currently that the Basel Committee is certainly looking at uh, and that we're interested in at the FSB on the, uh, on the use of, of capital buffers and, and buffers generally in a period of stress because it, it uh, seemed, it was clear that, and this was particularly the case internationally where they, where they had turned the buffer up and turned it down, you still didn't have banks that were willing to to uh, eat into their, uh, their capital buffers in order to expand lending. Uh, they said that things are gonna go back to normal pretty quickly. The market will punish us if we do it. You know, a variety of, of concerns that led this framework not really to be that effective in encouraging lending during a time of stress. We didn't run into a lot of that issue in the United States. Uh, there's not currently, uh, a significant problem with uh, sort of unsatisfied credit demand from creditworthy borrowers. Uh, but had there been uh, the excessive demand that we thought there might have been, one of the reasons for that is because of the, the you know, very significant amount of fiscal stimulus uh, that has been put into the economy. And had the banking sector uh, had to pull through more of that in forms of providing that uh, lending support, we could have, might have run into the same issues here. So I, I don't know what the answer to that is. It, we're, we're wrestling with that, but that's, that, that's more color around uh, the countercyclical capital buffer. And is it really uh, going to be uh, an effective tool going forward? That's terrific. Thank you for explaining that. I'm aware that we have 10 minutes left, so we're not gonna go quite to a lightning round, but I'm gonna, there's so many topics we want your views on. Um, one thing in this crisis a year ago um, was that the Fed's network of international swap lines with other central banks and then via the New York Fed to a whole different set of central banks, in my view and many observers' view, was a huge success in preventing liquidity problems during the crisis or during the initial economic impact of, of the COVID pandemic. So is there anything that you at the FSB or you all at the Fed are thinking about to build out that institution uh, to make it more sort of regular, I don't mean more frequent, but I mean less ad hoc in its usage in future, or is this something it worked beautifully and you're happy with it? Um, I mean, how do you build on this success? So, uh, so it's not really a, a, a topic at the FSB uh, currently, although I agree with you, it was, uh, 
uh, it, it was critical uh, to mean maintaining uh, global financial stability uh, in the early months of the event. Um, uh, and, you know, we're always looking at ways to improve the efficiency of what we do. But I, I, I myself, at least, think that we have seen that, you know, the use of the swap lines, both in the crisis of 2008 uh, and in March of uh, 2020, uh, worked pretty well. Uh, so uh, institutionalizing it, I'd say, is not, you know, I don't think that needs to be a high priority for us. Uh, uh, because it has worked pretty well, I do, and and we're and we've been able to roll it out pretty quickly, particularly in 2020. So, uh, 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 so I guess I'll just leave it at that. Um, turning again on international and more to the monetary sphere, although obviously financial stability as well, I'd like to ask you to comment on the issue of central bank digital currencies, um, the two largest, or arguably largest uh, monetary zones after the dollar, the People's Bank of China, the Euro area, um, are both doing, the central banks, the ECB and the PBOC are doing pretty out there public intents to develop their own central bank digital currencies to foment them. The Fed has not. Um, Governor Brainerd has spoken on this issue. Tomorrow we have, as I mentioned, Augustin Carstens of the BIS giving a speech to the central bank digital currencies. With your financial stability hat on, both at the FSB and at the Fed, how do you view central banks stepping into this room? Um, well, so I think that, uh, uh, let me speak about this mostly from the, uh, the Fed point of view, uh, in, you know, uh, my position as a, as a governor. I, you know, I, I think that's something that you know, technological developments are something that we should be on top of, uh, and we should certainly uh, be looking at that at the Fed. I, uh, I think we have to be clear in doing so uh, that we have framed the issue that we're trying to address uh, with central bank digital currency. And I do think that in a lot of the efforts globally uh, to look into this issue, that you know, that fundamental question of what are we trying to do uh, with this uh, is not clearly answered. Um, uh, there, you know, and, and I think the benefits in a country like the United States of CBDC, uh, they certainly, uh, they, they, they may exist um, and, and we should be active in looking into them. Uh, but I don't see an urgent uh, flaw in our system that a central bank digital currency, uh, central bank digital currency would, would fix. I'm, I'm just going to press you a little bit on this. Uh, my own personal views, frankly, are similar to what you just said, but there is a concern which our colleagues, Marcus Brunermeyer, Jean-Pierre Landau, and um, Harold James have raised, among others, that if we start having very solid central bank digital currencies, it could suck money out of more fragile currencies in emerging markets and developing countries. Um, again, in a sense, that's not narrowly your mission as the Fed or the FSB, but it seems like it's something to at least consider. Is this a topic you worry about at all, or does this come up in your discussions with PPOC or, or ECB? Um. I think it's a topic, you know, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a relevant topic. It's a, I mean, it's a relevant issue to consider in the broad range of issues to be considered. I mean, obviously, I think uh, uh, our primary uh, concern has to be, um, you know, the, the usefulness uh, and benefits and as well as uh, disadvantages and costs of central bank digital currency for the United States, um, principally, uh, you know, but we're not unmindful of the uh, of the potential knock-on consequences. Some of those are for other countries. Some of those are for the financial system itself. I mean, concerns about potential disintermediation of the uh, of the financial system and what the financial stability consequences of that might be. Um, uh, and again, I think we just, you know, one of the one of the most important early tasks will be coming to a clear and shared understanding 
of what exactly we'd be trying to achieve. And I, I don't think that that is either clear or shared yet. Thank you for being frank. Um, one of your roles and the Fed's roles is interacting with other U.S. regulatory and supervisory agencies through the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Um, coordination among the, the regulators and supervisors a year ago, March, seemed to go pretty well at a time when the Trump Mnuchin Treasury had cut back a lot, it seemed, on the staffing and support for uh, the FSOC. Um, how do you see the FSOC developing over the next couple of years? Is it, is it a priority to rebuild that or is it, it worked when the push came to shove so I'm not going to worry about it? Um, well, I think the, uh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting point. I hadn't really even uh, uh, focused on that. I think, I th so, you know, I, I, I think the SSOC uh, can be a useful mechanism. Uh, it's particularly a useful mechanism, though, for, um, uh, and, and I support whatever direction Secretary Yellen wants to take the FSOC in, right? I, I suspect that she will uh, sort of, uh, that she will be uh, more uh, active or the FSOC will be more active or take on a, perhaps a broader range of topics. And uh, I, I think that it can be very useful, but I think it's particularly useful in peacetime in uh, just the nature of the organization is very large. You have all those people around the table. It fills the entire secretary's large conference room. And that's a big room, as you know. And, uh, uh, and you've got a lot of, you know, there are lots of folks there with varying levels of, uh, you know, engagement on particular crisis actions. Uh, uh, so, you know, in a time of crisis, I don't know that a entity like that is really a, a crisis management mechanism. Uh, there's going to be a lot more, that's going to depend a lot more on bilateral, uh, you know, agency to agency action, uh, the core group of agencies most involved with whatever is the, uh, the core generator of a particular crisis. But in peacetime, in ensuring that you're looking at the broad financial sector uh, and thinking about what risks there might be and how regulation can be, or supervision can be refined uh, or improved uh, to enhance the resilience of the system. Uh, you know, those are questions like, are you designating a particular non-bank finance activity? You know, that's not a crisis response. You know, the, by that time, it's way too late to think about designating an activity. You ought to have been doing that before uh, to ensure that, that you are ready for uh, weakness in that activity uh, or questions about designating particular entities. Um, uh, so I think that at my, in my view, at least the FSOC is, is a useful organization, but more of a peacetime organization than a crisis organization. I think, it, I think you're absolutely right that the crisis management uh, from last year was largely non-FSOC and was largely very effective. Thank you. Um, just as a final question, you've covered so much. But of course, as part of your day job, you're also a voting member of the FOMC. So one question about your views on monetary policy. Uh, you and your committee members, your fellow committee members, uh, announced a new strategic framework for monetary policy at the end of August last year. We got to discuss it with your counterpart, Vice Chair Clarida, at that time. For you as an FOMC voter, how does the new framework imply any difference in, in your vote, in your planning, you know, as you consider raising rates in some future date. How do you view the framework either constraining or enabling you differently? And also just one more thing, if I could, how is it credible that the committee is going to allow an overshoot of the 2% target for any period of time? Is that a credible commitment from the committee? or does that commitment not exist? So, uh, uh, so let me take, uh, uh, there were a number of things there, so let me take, uh, let me take them all. Um, uh, and then let me take them in order. Uh, so, uh, so the framework does change uh, how I at least will respond to 
I, I'm one of the optimists on the committee, uh, but very optimistic about the uh, likely evolution of the uh, economy over the coming years, um, probably in the near term as, as well, but certainly uh, over the coming years of the horizon that uh, we project in the uh, summary of economic projections, for example. Um, and in under our prior framework, that level of optimism ab about the outlook uh, and about the projections for a lowering unemployment rate and uh, uh, you know, as, as well as some other views that I have uh, about uh, the possibility and the likelihood of a steeper Phillips curve over the coming decade as opposed to the previous decade, uh, would argue for uh, moving sooner rather than later. Uh, in beginning to withdraw accommodation uh, under our old framework. Under the new framework, uh, an, an optimist like me, and I, which I, and I think this is right, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. You know, under the new framework, you know, the fact that my projections are optimistic uh, and that I see, um, I, I would project that the unemployment rate will fall, uh, you know, pretty quickly and substantially, uh, would argue for beginning to act now. Under, I mean, under the new, I'm sorry, that's the old framework. Under the new framework, you know, we would wait to see that you actually see movement. You, you would wait to see that that actually comes down. The fact that I am an optimist is not really relevant under our new framework. Uh, it says, well, I believe we'll get to that point where we're seeing those outcomes sooner than others, but we shouldn't jump the gun, let's wait until we see those outcomes. And clearly the performance of the macroeconomy and the performance of monetary policy over the course of the last, not just decade, really even 15, 20 years, uh, would argue that, that that leads to superior outcomes. I've said this publicly before, I'll, I'll say it now. I mean, one of the, the major achievements of uh, Janet Yellen when she was chair of the Fed uh, and I was very skeptical of this. I wasn't on the Fed board at the time, but very skeptical of allowing uh, sort of the uh, unemployment rate to fall as low as it did and continue to fall as low as it did while being quite gradual uh, about raising interest rates, not raising them for a long time. And we saw the benefits to the labor market of doing that. We did not see concomitant inflation. Uh, and there were many more people uh, particularly in kind of the lower echelons of the labor market that were drawn in um, and benefited uh, from that uh, from that stance. Uh, uh, so I'm very supportive of our new outcome-based framework, um, and and really I think that that will be true of of the committee. I think it's very credible to expect the committee to be comfortable with inflation uh, somewhat over our 2% target. Um, uh, I myself uh, don't believe that we need to have some sort of mathematical equivalency. If you go three years below uh, by, uh, you know, by 20 basis points, you've got to go three years above by 20 basis points. Um, and, and the framework sort of very expressly doesn't state that kind of mathematical uh, averaging, but rather that over time we'll, we will look to average. And I, I think that, that that's a very credible commitment from the committee. Uh, and I'm certainly supportive of it. And as I say, I'm one of the, uh, the biggest optimists on the committee. Vice Chair Quarles, Chair of the Financial Stability Board. Um, thank you so much for your depth of knowledge, you're sharing your insights with us, your willingness to make clear your views, and especially for your current and past years of public service. We are very proud to have had you with us today at the Peterson Institute. Thanks so much, Adam. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>